Please be all feel welcome to the Omar Nego Foundation, the representatives of his organizations, institutions, partners, friends of the Omar Dengo Foundation, teachers and students, members of the press, collaborators of the Omar Dengo Foundation and the National uh, School Program, dear public and people online. On behalf of the Omar Dengo Foundation, we welcome you warmly and we thank you for joining us together on our annual conference 2017 called Planting the Seeds for a More Creative Society with Dr. Michael Rednick. This conference is held within the framework of the 30th anniversary of the Omar Denko Foundation anniversary. Uh, the conference will be in English so we have simultaneous translation devices outside of the lobby. Please present your ID to get your device. If you are listening to us streaming, you can listen to the translation into Spanish. At the end of the presentation, we will have time for questions and answers. So during the conference, please write down your questions on the papers that you were given at the entrance. Questions will be collected by several of our colleagues of the Omar Dengo Foundation who are located in strategic points. So just raise your hand so it can be the official hashtag for the activity is CA2017. So yeah, you can post your comments and follow us in the social media. On the other hand, Mr. Dr. Resnick's book is being sold outside the room. We have few uh, samples, but you can find coupons for a 30% discount so you can buy your digital or hard copy online. Now we will give an opportunity to Dr. Lea Munoz, Executive Director of the Omar de Gaulle Foundation, who will address the audience to welcome all of you. Good afternoon. Welcome everybody to the Omar Dengo Foundation and to our annual lecture. Our guest speaker this afternoon is Dr. Mitchell Resnick, a distinguished professor and researcher who specializes in the media lab learning area of MIT. This year, 2017, the foundation is celebrating its 30th anniversary since its, its creation in 1987. It is not a coincidence that Dr. Resnick is our guest speaker. Resnick, Dr. Resnick was a student of Dr. Signa Papert, who came 30 years ago and sat together with the founding group of the foundation, a group of academics, scientists, educators, and business people to respond to the two large questions that would distinguish the work that the Mardenko Foundation has done. Why do we want to bring computers into the classroom and how we can reach that objective? What is our educational strategy? At that time, computers were introduced slowly and even in the most advanced countries and they were introduced so that students who were in the last years of high school getting ready to enter the labor market could have the opportunity to learn how to use the computers in their basic tasks that were most important at the time, such as how to use a word processor, a spreadsheet, or audiovisual support material, and or a presentation, so not, nothing more than that. Costa Rica made the unexpected decision of bringing computers to elementary school, not in high school, and using them to teach students to think to develop cognitive capacities of a higher level. We are talking about logical thinking, problem solution, collaboration, design. Dr. Pepper, who was a disciple of Piaget, understood very well the great potential of computers as a tool to think and, and learn, to support the personal construction of the new knowledge. And the foundation decided, by suggestion of Dr. Papert to teach students to code. During that 
process of learning to code computers, students would be developing those cognitive skills that we are trying to achieve. That clarity in educational ex learning has been key to design and implement a program such as a PRONI. Costa Rica then within the international framework use this innovative approach. Elementary school students in Costa Rica will learn to code as a strategy to learn to think creatively. 30 years later, we have seen how the most advanced countries have made the same decision and then coding it became a fashion and part of educational systems. And so last year I visited schools in Seoul, Korea, and they used how they had a program, to a, kind, a couple of lessons for students to learn to code. This was one of the pilot schools that being developed in South Korea, a country that is distinguished by its level of connectivity, adoption of digital technologies, and results in the international educational tests such as PISA. Today, I have no question that Dr. Papert foresaw this. In societies where there are more smartphones than people, in which the Internet of Things, robotics, and inti artificial intelligence are introduced in our daily lives in a m deeper fashion, L knowing the language of coding becomes fundamental to understand the digital society and be able to actively participate and proactively participate in this digital society. The extraordinary Korean professor Peck Sho in his opening statements in this symposium in Korea, when asked what are the competencies that children need to develop faced with the fourth industrial revolution to be digital citizens, a question that we are ourselves are asking, told us that each society, each country, each community, each school faces the disjunctive of educating to teach creators or educate to create consumers of what has already been created by others. So see the importance of this choice. We educate the new generations to be capable of creating and contributing with their talent and actions and interests so that they can participate in shaping the world in which we live and in the world in which they will live. Or should we teach, educate them for people who can consume products and resources of others who are creative? What they put in our phones, in our cars, in our homes, everywhere. Create Creativity. Dr. Resnick can talk a lot about creativity. His most recent book, whose title is something like From Kindergarten through, Throughout Life, Lifelong Kindergarten, deals on how to cultivate creativity. The book reminds us that the kindergarten model was established 180 years ago in 1837 in Germany by Froebel, who understood that children flourish. And that's why the name kindergarten, they flourish better when the right conditions are set. And in his time, he proposed an educational model that was completely different to that space that we think recognized to have great value to develop human beings' capabilities. Dr. Resnick affirms once and once again that unfortunately the trend is for kindergartens to look more like the rest of the school when the right direction should be the opposite, that the rest of the school should be more closely similar to the kindergarten proposed by Frodo. As Ken Robinson points out, digital technologies have allowed tools for productivity, for creative production in any field, music, mathematics, architecture, ki cooking, history, whatever, all these tools that for centuries were in the hands of just a few privileged people now are widespread and available to all. 
And this is the great difference, the access and use, generalized use of uh, powerful tools at, at levels that are not seen before. Unfortunately, computers, tablets, and other devices continue being used in with a lot of frequency just to transmit and consume rather than to think and create. For 30 years, we have been insisting at the Omar Dengo Foundation that the difference is given by the use that you make of the tool and not by the tool itself. It doesn't mean to distribute devices, but to create the conditions to take advantage of it, their great potential, to nourish the capacity to think and create that people have, and to do that within the context of an, uh, school, it is necessary to design those conditions to f for children to flourish that Frober wanted to bring to the kindergarten. Scientific research that has been accumulated, the great advances in neurosciences and other sciences support these ideas. Today, the media lab in the hands of new generations, and in particular under Dr. Resnick's leadership, honor Popper and San Frobel's ideas and have found and proposed new and creative paths to feed the curiosity to continue exploring, learning, enjoying, collaborating just as we did when we were attending kindergarten in what seemed to be a game. This is why we think it is extraordinarily valuable the, uh, that our honor guest this year is Mr. Resnick. Welcome back, Mitch, to the Martin Engel Foundation, to this laboratory where Popper, you, and the whole Media Lab 30 years ago play and created with us with passion and vision to help us design a program that has become an international reference, but above all, has offered valuable opportunities to thousands of kids, hundreds of thousands of kids really, around the entire country to learn to think creatively to stimulate and nurture the natural capacities. Logo first and scratch later have certainly been important instruments for that, really a distinctive seal to our program. Thank you for accepting our invitation. It is a great honor and a pleasure to have you here. The stage is all yours. It's wonderful to be back in Costa Rica. I've probably been here I mean, at least a dozen times so I have to apologize that my Spanish is still not very good uh, after all of those visits. So I'm sorry that I'm not able to speak to you in Spanish. But coming back here always does bring back lots of wonderful memories from all the visits over the years, especially in those very early years. It was in 1989 that I made my first visit here, right as the, problem, right as the initiative with the computers and schools was getting started. I reached out to, this is uh, the images from that very first visit, in early 1989, and there I am, <laughs> fully a half lifetime ago. And Seymour Papert, who is my mentor, I was working with Seymour, and obviously all of the ideas that I'll be talking about today were deeply, deeply influenced by Seymour. I think he really set a vision uh, that I th I've been spending my life trying to bring some of Seymour's ideas into practice. So, and it's also wonderful to see some of the people in this photo or in the audience today. Uh, so it's great to see some of those longtime colleagues from many years ago. At a time where, you know, I think there was this incredible feeling of purpose, making this, you know, doing something fundamentally important for the country. And it was exciting to be here, to be part of that. And then to continue to connect with the foundation over the years. I had wonderful meetings this morning with leaders from the foundation about the next you know, directions that they'll be taking in the years to come. Uh, so this was in 1989. I was then going to jump and tell a story from 10 years later than that, 1999, right before the turn of the new century, the turn of the new millennium. And at the time, I was invited to go to a conference where people were reflecting back on some of the greatest accomplishments of the past thousand years, and also making predictions about the upcoming thousand years. And I was on a panel at the conference where we were asked the following question. 
what was the most important invention of the past thousand years? And obviously, there were an incredible number of, incredible number of important inventions over that time. And some people on the panel pointed to the printing press, uh, which changed the way we communicate over time and over distance. Others mentioned the steam engine, which brought in the Industrial Revolution, which transformed all aspects of society. Others talked about the computer, invented right at the end of the thousand years, but obviously having a deep influence, uh, not just in the past thousand years, but certainly looking ahead. Now, all of those were very, very important inventions. Each transformed society in its own way. But as I thought about the most important invention of the past thousand years, I had a different response. My suggestion was kindergarten. Now, some people were surprised at the mention of kindergarten, but many people don't see kindergarten as an invention, let alone an important invention. But it really was an invention. When Friedrich Froebel invented the first kindergarten in 1837, he was not just opening a school for younger children, he really was inventing a radically different approach to education. It was fundamentally different than what had come before it. And although Froebel couldn't possibly have known this, he was also inventing an approach to education which is ideally suited to the needs of today's 21st century, not just for five-year-olds, but for all of us, for learners of all ages. And I'll be returning to that theme through my remarks about why kindergarten serves as such a wonderful model for learning in the 21st century. Well, what is it that makes it so special? What was special about Froebel's invention? Well, before Froebel, education was done in what might be called a broadcast mode. A teacher stood in front of the classroom and broadcast information and instruction to students. And Froebel recognized that that broadcast approach would certainly not work for five-year-olds. So he shifted to a much more interactive approach. And as part of this, Froebel was not just an educator, but he was a designer. So he designed and developed a set of toys and materials that became known as Froebel's gifts. Uh, they were especially designed to engage kids in playing and building and interacting. And with Froebel's you know, uh, geometric tiles, children were building mosaic patterns. With Froebel's blocks, children could build towers and buildings. With Froebel's sticks and peas, children could assemble different three-dimensional assemblies. Now, if you go into, a kinder if you go into kindergarten today, you'll see many current-day descendants of Froebel's gifts and Froebel's ideas. You'll see children playfully creating things in collaboration with one another. And in the process, Children are learning many important ideas and concepts. When children build houses and castles out of wooden blocks, they learn about structure and stability. When children make pictures with finger paint, they learn how colors mix together. So they're learning many important concepts. But to me, what's much more important, much more important, is that children, as they work on these projects, are developing as creative thinkers. They're learning about the creative process how to start with an inkling of an idea and turn it into a project, how to imagine a new idea, test it out, share it with others, and then refine the ideas based on their experiences. So these creative thinking skills you know, that children learn in kindergarten are sort of, you know, really set off kids on a good path towards life, that they really are starting to develop the creative thinking that is so important, especially in today's society. I think one thing that we see is that creative thinking is more important today than ever before. And that's because we're living in a fast-changing society. I think we can all agree that the world is changing more rapidly than ever before. That today's children will face an endless stream of unknown situations and unpredictable challenges. So the ability to think and act creatively is going to be more important than ever before. So kindergarten is really providing exactly what children need to flourish in today's society. But there's a problem, because after kindergarten, education typically turns to a much different approach. It looks much more like this, of a type of broadcast model again, where a teacher 
is delivering instruction or delivering information. And even when new technology enters the classroom, oftentimes the technology delivers instruction or delivers information. So that's not at all aligned with the needs of today's society. It doesn't help children develop as creative thinkers. And sadly, this approach is even seeping down into kindergarten. If you walk into many kindergartens today, you will see more and more children filling out phonics worksheets and drilling on math flashcards. Kindergarten, in many places, is becoming more like the rest of school. And what I want to argue is for exactly the reverse. We want to make the rest of school, in fact, the rest of life, more like kindergarten. So that's the, the, the underlying goal for my research group at the MIT Media Lab, which is mentioned is called the Lifelong Kindergarten Group. That's why I called my new book Lifelong Kindergarten. Uh, because I think you know, the real goal is to see how is it that we can extend that spirit of kindergarten to learners of all ages, make it possible for everybody to continue to learn like a kindergarten child and continue to develop as a creative thinker. So how is it that we can best do that? As I've thought about that, I've boiled the kindergarten approach to learning down to four core guiding principles uh, that I call the four P's of creative learning. Projects, passion, peers, and play. So in all the work that we do, we're always, always thinking about how can we provide children with opportunities to work on projects, that they're passionate about in collaboration with peers in a playful spirit. So whenever we develop new technologies, new activities, new spaces, we're always thinking how we can be guided by those four Ps of creative learning so that we can help children develop as creative thinkers. You know, and over the years, we've worked on many different types of projects. You know, our group has worked for actually 30 years now, about the same time as the foundation was getting started, we started collaborating with the Lego toy company. And we've worked with them over the years on adding computation, electronics to traditional Lego bricks. Of course, traditional Lego bricks, I think, very much fit that spirit of kindergarten, providing opportunities for children to build things out of their passion and collaboration with others. And we've wanted to extend it. And it's been great to work with the foundation here on a lot of the robotics initiatives in the schools to be able to take those ideas out to the world and of course, this weekend, there's the World Robotics Olympiad that sort of grows out of some of those efforts. But it's not enough just to have the technologies. Uh, you know, the technologies are a good starting point. We can think of those technologies as somewhat like Froebel gifts for the 21st century, that they're you know, really based on the same ideas that Froebel was doing, but using technologies that were you know, unavailable and unimaginable to Froebel. But it sort of takes those... Froebel's core ideas and brings new technologies in the spirit. But the technology themselves can't do it all. So we're always looking for different spaces, uh, the same way that the Foundation here works in schools across the country. We've looked in different places where we can try out the technologies and the ideas. One of the places that we've tried things out over the years to support creative thinking is a network of after-school learning centers called computer clubhouses. These are places where young people can go and learn to express themselves creatively with new technologies. With support from the Intel Foundation, we've opened up clubhouses around the world, including three of them here in Costa Rica. So you have them around the world. Uh, in fact, the top left is a picture from Costa Rica. In fact, Jimmy is in that picture at an earlier age is here. So the, I met through the clubhouse many years ago and helped with the workshop that we're doing this afternoon. Uh, in fact, even just found out that actually Jimmy just turned 30, just like the Omar Dengo Foundation did. So they've grown up together in this sort of new world of creative possibilities of new technologies. But at the clubhouses, you know, our real goal is to see how can we have kids not just learn how to use the technology, but to express themselves creatively, to think creatively with the technology. So we're always putting those four Ps of creative learning at work. Let me show you a video from the clubhouses in Boston, some of the early clubhouses in Boston. And this is where we were trying out some of the initial prototypes for the Lego programmable bricks. And we tried trying out the prototypes at the clubhouse, as we often try out prototypes at these centers. And we asked a group of children, it was 10 to 13-year-old girls, we said, try to use this technology to invent something that would be useful to you in your everyday life. 
Again, we want to connect with their passions, something that would be useful to them. At the end of the workshop, a local television station came and made a video of the project, and I'll show that now. Yeah, see? It just beeps. Christina Costa is trying to build a better mouse trap. Make that gerbil trap. Every time they want to go inside this gerbil house, they press this light sensor. It's one of the many inventions created at this free math and science camp run by the Computer Museum and the Girl Scouts, where girls from Boston are devising everything from an odometer for rollerblades to a diary security system. When someone touches this to try to open the diary, it'll take a picture of that person. So like if your creepy little brother tries to read your diary? Yeah. He's on camera. Yes. <laughs> I think even from that short video, you can get a sense of putting those four Ps into practice, that the Girls' Night Workshop will work on projects based on their passions in collaboration with peers and a playful spirit. You know, if you look at the, the very first girl with the house for the gerbil, she wasn't just building a house for any old gerbil, she was building a house for her gerbil. So she was deeply passionate about it because she wanted her gerbil to have a nice house, to have an automatic door. And she also wanted to learn more about her gerbil. She was interested, what does their gerbil do during the day while she's at school? Or what does their gerbil do at night while she's sleeping? So she had the computer keep track of every time the door opened and shut. It collected the data so that she would know what her gerbil was doing. And she found out that you know, in the middle of the night, it would go in and out and in and out. So it was a way for her to get a better connection you know, with, with her pet. Or the second girl with the rollerblades, she loved rollerblading. It was her real passion. Uh, and she was always curious about how fast was she going on her rollerblades. She knew when she rode in the car with her parents that the car was going 30 miles per hour or kilometers per hour you know, or so. And she wanted to know how fast it was that she was going on her rollerblades. So she attached a little magnetic sensor to the wheel of the rollerblade so it would count every time the wheel rotated. So she could easily get the rotations per second, but she wanted to know in miles per hour. So she had to do a unit conversion of rotations per second to miles per hour. And in her school, the classes, there had been a class about how to do those types of unit conversions in math, but she hadn't really paid attention because she really didn't see a purpose to it. And unfortunately, that's the way many kids see lessons in school. But now she had a real purpose. She wanted to know how fast she was going, so she spent a lot of time and effort to figure out how to do those conversions. So that passion really paid off, which was really able to dive in and make sense of it. So I think these are the types of ways that we want to support kids growing up so they can learn those mathematical ideas, but also develop as a creative thinker, learn about that creative process. Now, these examples involve kids creating things in the physical world. But we know that today's kids also spend a lot of time in the online world and in virtual worlds. And we want to make sure the kids also have kindergarten-like learning experiences in the online world. Too often, we see kids spending time just you know, browsing and chatting and playing games, not really having the type of kindergarten experience of exploring and experimenting and expressing themselves. So it really was trying to give kids that kindergarten experience online is what led us to develop the Scratch, our Scratch project. Uh, again, as was mentioned, Scratch builds on a long tradition at MIT from Seymour Papert's logo. But we saw there was a need to bring that into the 21st century. In fact, it was by working at the clubhouses, we saw that young people really wanted to create their own interactive stories and games and animations, but they didn't have a good way of doing it. Logo really weren't, wasn't able to let them express themselves and use the new media that was coming online or to share their projects. At the same time, the kids at the clubhouse, they weren't ready to start learning Java or C++ to make games and animations. So they really you know, didn't have anywhere to turn. So we saw this as a great opportunity where there was a real demand from kids, but we knew it would be a great learning experience. And we're always trying to link that together. Kids' interests with important ideas. And that's what Scratch was doing, bringing together kids' interests with important ideas. Uh, so in order to, 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 that's how it led us to launch Scratch. It was 10 years ago. This is the 10th anniversary of the launch of Scratch. As many of you probably are familiar with, with Scratch, kids can build up projects
by snapping together graphical blocks, somewhat like snapping together Lego bricks, and each of those stacks of blocks will control the behaviors of one of the characters in your game or story. In this case, it was a game of you know, a fish eating another fish. Importantly, after you make your creation, you can click on the share button and share your creation in the online community with other peers. Again, the, 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 the third P, peers. We knew that children would learn better, not just by working by themselves, but in interacting with others. We saw the online community play this very special role of being both an inspiration and an audience, a place where children could go to see what's possible, but also a place where they could put up their own creations and get feedback and advice from others. So we launched them at the exact same time, again, guided by those four Ps, recognizing it wasn't enough just to give them the tools, but also to provide them with a community where they could build and share with one another. Since Scratch has come out, it's been growing and growing. This is the number of new members over the years. Last year, there were more than 6 million new members. Overall, there's more than 20 members of the online community. Every day, there's about 25,000 new kids from around the world who are joining. And although those numbers are great, and we're proud of them, we're much more proud, not just of the number of members and the number of projects, but the diversity of what they create. If you go on the Scratch website, you see this incredible diversity of projects. Everything from animated stories, to interactive birthday cards, to anime comic strips. This was done by a girl who loved drawing anime. Uh, and then she started putting them online, and every week would put up another one, like a TV series. Or virtual construction kits. This was made by a boy in, in Belgium who took Lego, made virtual Lego bricks and made a construction kit online where you could put virtual Lego bricks together, something we didn't even imagine was possible when we created Scratch. Kids create recreations of classic video games like Donkey Kong or invent their new dress-up doll games, or they make tutorials. We knew that when we created Scratch that we would make some tutorials and the teachers would might make some tutorials. We would never imagine the kids would create thousands and thousands of tutorials like You Gotta Love Variables by a, a young person who loved using variables and wanted to share what she had learned with others so they could use variables in their projects as well. So there's a wide range of different types of tutorials that kids will share. You know, everything from how to use the paint editor to how to make your projects popular in the online community. We also see kids doing interactive artwork and science simulations. And I think this variety makes us so happy, but to us it's an indication that kids are following their passions, because we know that different kids have different interests. So if all kids are following their interests, we would expect to see a wide variety of different types of projects. So we're really happy to see it, and happy to see that Scratch is able to support that wide range of projects. When we run a workshop, that's one of our indicators of success. At the end of the workshop, we don't necessarily look for where they're really sophisticated projects, but rather, is there a diversity of projects? Because if all the projects are too alike, we feel something went wrong. Kids probably weren't following their interest and they weren't developing as creative thinkers. So one of our key indicators of success, whether it's in a workshop or a class that we teach, is the diversity of projects over time. The diversity of projects also is an indication of the wide range of ways that kids can use coding. Um, when we've seen coding, you know, right now, as you know, there's a lot of interest around the world in coding, but oftentimes it's just focused on helping kids learn a technical skill towards getting job opportunities as a programmer or a computer scientist. And don't get me wrong, there are good job opportunities, but that's not our goal. It's not just about learning technical skills. For us, we see coding as a way of kids expressing themselves, to share their ideas with others. We really take seriously the, the analogy between coding and writing. We don't teach kids to write because we expect all of them to grow up to become professional writers or journalists or novelists. Everyone should learn to write, regardless of what they're going to grow up to be because writing is a way to organize your ideas and express your ideas and share your ideas with others. The exact same is true for coding. Coding is a way to help everyone learn to organize their ideas, to share their ideas, to develop your voice, and to share your ideas with others. It's very much like the great literacy movements of, of the world. Paulo Freire's literacy movements of Brazil was not just about job, job skills, it was about making sure that everyone felt that they could express their ideas 
and that you needed to learn to write if you're going to feel like you're going to be a full citizen, a full member of society. And we see coding the same way. It's not just about job skills, although there are job skills, but it's to make everybody feel that they really can be a full contributor to the society around them. So we're happy when we look at schools that are using Scratch. You know, there are some schools that just use it in a computer science class, and that's fine, but that's not what we're most excited about. We're most excited when it gets used the same way writing is used in schools. Writing is used across the curriculum. So we love it when we see how Scratch just becomes a new way of expressing yourself, a new form of writing that gets used in all of the classes. I mean, just to show examples, here's one from a class in India. It was a science class where they were studying the layers of the earth. He's giving a guided tour. He was from Bangalore. He's speaking in his native language of Kannada. And every day his teacher explained to us that this student was really excited to learn that things are moving inside the earth. So as he gives the guided tour, he's saying that things are moving inside the earth. You know, and when he gets to the water table, there's sound effects to show that there are things splashing around inside the earth. Or here's another example from a social studies class where they're studying Rapa Nui, or Easter Island, the island off of South America. And the student in this class decided to do something similar to Sim City, but it was Sim Rapa Nui, a, a simulation based on what he had learned about the history, the culture, and the economy of Rapa Nui. He learned that fishing was at the core of the economy. So to survive in this game, you have to be able to fish. You have to cut down a tree branch to make a fishing rod to fish. But if you cut down too many trees, your God happiness score will go down. Because he, again, he was trying to show what he had learned about the culture, history, economy, and share that with other people. Or one more example from an elementary school. It was a class where they learned Scratch at the beginning of the year and then used it for all of their different projects. This was a book report in the class where they were reading the children's book Charlotte's Web. I know that this was done for a, a language class, and you can see that the children are, are writing about the book they read, and they're, and they're explaining it, so they're developing their language skills. But as I see this, I also notice, notice as the pig goes forward and back, the pig's getting smaller. The student was learning about perspective, so it was also an art lesson, learning if you want to make something look further away, you make it smaller. And then you have to develop mathematical skills. To make that pig get smaller, you have to multiply it by a fraction less than one to scale it, get smaller and smaller over time. So it's cutting across the disciplines. I think that's exactly what we're always looking for, to see how kids can work on meaningful projects that make use of things across the whole spectrum of what they are learning in school. So we're excited when we see this. And we are excited that kids are using Scratch not just in school, but outside of school. The same way you don't use writing only in school, but when kids learn to write, you know, kids will write their own stories, and they write in their diary, and they write letters to friends. And we see the same thing with Scratch. Let me tell you the story about one member of the Scratch community. Her Scratch username is Ipsy. And uh, from an early age, Ipsy uh, loved to draw. Every day after school, Ipsy would fill notebooks with sketches and drawings. And then one day, a friend of Ipsy's explained to Ipsy about Scratch, saying that Ipsy could use Scratch to make their drawings come alive. And Ipsy was really intrigued with this, so decided to try out Scratch and use some of you know, their drawings to, to, come to, to, see, to, put them in, to bring them to life. So here's one of the first Scratch projects that Ipsy worked on. And Ipsy took one of their drawings and noticed just added a little bit of animation. The eyes are moving a little bit. The ears are moving a little bit. And what I love about this project is you sort of see that Ipsy is using a good strategy for learning. It's often a good strategy to start with something you're familiar with, you're passionate about, in this case, drawing, and then reach out and try to learn something new, in this case, coding. Uh, and I think that's you know, something that Ipsy was learning, how to start exploring, to start with something you're comfortable with, but to reach out and try something new. And Ipsy really enjoyed seeing their drawings come to life and started to work on other types of projects. Over time, they became more, the projects became more and more sophisticated. Here's one project that got Ipsy well-known in the community. It's called Lemonade Time. And when you play this game, you use the arrow keys to move the otter, and you have to collect all the ingredients 
to make lemonade, the lemons, the sugar, the water, and you get tips and guidance from the different animals that you meet, the bird, the frog. So this got online, Ipsy shared it in the online community, and it became very popular in the online community. If you look at the project page for this project, you'll see that it was, it was viewed more than 17,000 times by kids around the world. It was loved almost 2,000 times. It was remixed 88 times. That means that someone else took Ipsy's project, made some changes to the scripts or to the graphics, and made it their own. And that's part of what the Scratch community is about, building on each other's work. So again, Ipsy was learning to live in a community where people build on one another's work. There were also lots of comments, nearly 2,000 comments, giving feedback and suggestions and encouragement. And you can see that Ipsy really paid attention to the comments. If you look at the instructions, it says, due to popular demand, the otter walks a little faster now. <laughs> so again, Ipsy was really listening to peers, taking their advice, and like any good designer, changing you know, the way that they were working based on the advice. Ipsy continued to work on things that were you know, connected to their passions. Ipsy was very passionate about LGBT issues, gay and lesbian issues, and wanted to care about you know, spreading issues around equity and equality with, uh, related to, to sexual orientation and gender identity, and made a project like this to help spread the ideas. So this was a platform game about gender where you go around and you pick up different flags in order to get a sword in order to fight the fat cat, which is, the, which is discriminating in society. So it's a way for Ipsy to be lashing out against the discrimination that Ipsy was seeing in society. So again, building on a, a topic that was, that was really a passion of Ipsy's. As people looked at Ipsy's projects, many of them liked Ipsy's artwork, and they started asking in the comments, can we see more of your artwork? We'd love to use some of your artwork. So Ipsy started putting up projects like this one, which were just studios of artwork, branded Ipsy Studio, where you could just see a collection of different artwork. And as Ipsy shared this, you know, Ipsy put up some rules and policies, said, you must credit me if you use any of these, but you can edit them as much as you want. And again, Ipsy was learning to be a good member of an online community, of sharing with others, but also expecting credit. So this is sometimes a problem and a challenge in the Scratch online community, that many kids, they put up a project, and if someone remixes it or uses part of it, they'll get upset, and they'll say, you know, so-and-so stole my work, or they, you know, they're, they're, they're doing something wrong. And we have to talk about the fact that in Scratch, we encourage everybody to build on each other's work. That and, and Ipsy, you can see, was really understanding that. Ipsy came to recognize that everyone benefits when everyone shares. I really like the fact that actually one of my colleagues at MIT, a faculty member in the physics department, came up to me one day and said that his sons used Scratch and he wanted to thank me about it. And since he was a physics professor, I assumed he was going to say that it was great that his sons were learning the technical skills of programming. But that's not what he said. He said what he loved best about Scratch is the way that they were sharing in the online community and they were learning how the scientific community works. My colleague said, this is how the scientific community works. We all build on each other's work. We cite other people and build on their work. He said, my sons are learning that same thing in Scratch. And that's what made him so happy that his sons were using Scratch. So if we look back at Ipsy's projects, again, you can see these four Ps at work. Ipsy was working on projects based on their passions, in collaboration with peers, in a playful spirit. Now, in some way, if you look at this, it might seem obvious to do things this way, but it's far from obvious. If you look at most learning to code initiatives around the world, they aren't project-based. Oftentimes, they get kids started by giving kids puzzles to solve. And you know, they say, here's a puzzle to solve, you solve it, then move on to the next puzzle. Now, there's nothing wrong with puzzles. I enjoyed puzzles growing up. I still enjoy solving puzzles. But it's a little bit like if you wanted to teach kids to learn to write and all you gave them were crossword puzzles. Now, crossword puzzles are great, but kids are not going to learn to express themselves if all they do is crossword puzzles. They'll learn vocabulary and spelling, but we want kids to learn to express themselves. You need to do that through projects, and that's what Ipsy was doing. Clearly, she was working on passions, building on 
her interest in, in drawing and sketching and, and some of her other interests in life. And also she was connecting with peers through all the different projects she did. She was learning how to be part of that community. So we can see in all of these, and she was doing a playful spirit. And when we say play, I don't just mean laughter and fun, although I'm sure Ipsy was having fun doing this. But when we talk about play, we don't just mean the activity of play, but an attitude uh, where you're always experimenting and trying new things and testing the boundaries. To us, that's what play is about. It's a type of engagement with the world. And you can see this in Ipsy's projects, that Ipsy was really engaging with the world and try, always trying new things. Had this incredible variety of different types of projects. So you can see that Ipsy was really learned to be a risk taker, uh, trying new things, experimenting through the work that, 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 that they were doing on Scratch. Now, of course, we're very excited about the ways that young people around the world are using Scratch today, but we can never stand still. The same way we were talking about with the foundation this morning, as far as the foundations come in 30 years, things keep changing. Society changes, technology changes. It's always, there's always a need to change, to stay up and to stay ahead and to stay true to the values, but to always add new elements to allow, to allow kids to keep learning, connected to interests and the, and the new ideas of the day. And that's what we're doing with Scratch as well, trying to bring to a next generation. So we're working on the next generation of Scratch that will come out next year in 2018. I was you, going to give you a sneak peek of some of the things that we're doing. One of the things that will be different with the new version of Scratch is that the current version of Scratch was mostly focused on making you know, graphical animations and stories and games that exist on the screen. And we really wanted to sort of break out of that with the next generation of Scratch to make it much easier to connect Scratch to things in the physical world and also to connect Scratch to things in the online world to pull down data. If you want to make a weather map, you should be able to use Scratch to pull in real-time weather, weather data into Scratch or connect to other web services. So we want Scratch to become a programmable hub that children can use to connect to all different things they're doing in their lives. So let me give this a try. Doing, real dem real, doing live demonstrations is often a little bit risky, but we'll give it a try here. So what I have here is this is a new type of interface device that we're creating that is designed for kids to build things in the physical world around it to then control the things they build on the screen. Uh, and it's looking for the device, and it's not finding it. I'm going to try one more. If you bear with me, I'm going to try one more moment. And let's just see. Oh. So again, the idea is to give children a, a simple device that they, that they can build around. But in this case, as we start the project, <laughs> I tilt the desk. You're not there. It's, it's cutting off the bottom of the screen, but I hope you can hey. there. So I'm like using this flying bicycle to try to catch things as they're falling. So this is using a tilt sensor. And if I hit the button. Now, of course, kids play games like this all the time these days with the Nintendo Wii and different handheld wireless devices. But kids play these games. But they generally don't get a chance to build these games. So what we want to do is give kids multiple ways of building and creating, both building a physical artifact. If you're making a bicycle game, build bicycle handlebars like this. Uh, and then we give kids a new set of blocks. So you know, blocks are saying, you know, when it's tilted in a certain direction, or when the button presses do this, or change the x direction by the tilt angle. So again, letting kids give them the building blocks. So what we want to do is we're making some devices like this we tentatively call this the Scratch bit. We hope to have this come out. But we also want everybody else, we're making Scratch open source, so anybody making any type of physical device can make their own Scratch blocks. They can build on our basic framework and have their own specialized blocks for controlling their physical devices. So no matter what people, whatever developers come up with, there's a way to use Scratch to then control it. Let me show one more example. It's not in the physical world, but in the online world. So this is an example that's using Scratch to connect to the online music service Spotify. I assume a lot of you know about Spotify, which is a way to you know, get music from online. 
So generally, it's a pretty passive system where you're sort of just downloading and listening to music. But you should be able to use Scratch to, as part of a Scratch project, decide to pull in music and then sync up your animations with it. So that's what we're trying here. So we're going to give this a try. Let's, we'll see. So if I start this program, there's a program that was written where it says, what's your favorite song or musician? So if I say something like Madonna, So what this is doing is, in the program, you can, the program can sort of take an input, send it out to Spotify, get something coming back, and then it doesn't just play the song, but if you notice, the characters are being in sync with it. If we look at the code, which is always an important part of Scratch, being able to look at the code, you see there are new blocks like every beat. So this is the key script right here. It says, every beat, make a new costume. So but the, the music from Spotify comes back with beat information, so we make that accessible to the kids. So they can say, what do I want to have happen to every beat of the song? So basically, we're trying to give kids new you know, building blocks to interact with things that they find online. So they shouldn't just be going out and interacting, but bring in things from online, and we want to give them the building blocks so they can use that as the raw materials for doing more things in the world. Let me end with a story that goes back to kindergarten. It's a story that involves two kindergarten children. And I heard this story from a friend of mine who has a daughter named Lily in kindergarten. And one day, Lily came home, was talking to her mom, and was talking about one of her friends in kindergarten, a, another kindergarten student named Daisy. And evidently, Daisy had started kindergarten at a very early age and was spending a second year in kindergarten. So Lily was talking to Daisy, and then Lily reported this to her mom. This is the way Lily described it to her mom. Lily said, Daisy did kindergarten last year and is doing it again this year for two whole years. I want to do kindergarten again too. So as I heard this story, of course, partly I was happy because it was nice to hear that Lily was really enjoying kindergarten. And I think Lily appreciated and recognized that kindergarten was a special place and a special time. But as I, as I heard the comment, I also detected some sense of concern on Lily's part, that I think somehow also Lily recognized that she might never again have the same opportunities for creative expression and creative play that she was having in kindergarten. Um, and I share Lily's concerns, you know, and I want to do something about it, because I want to make sure that, you know, that young children like Lily and Daisy, as they grow up and leave kindergarten, will continue to have opportunities to continue to interact in a kindergarten spirit, to continue to have opportunities to explore and experiment and express themselves. So I think we need to find ways of doing that to make sure that they have the opportunities for projects, passion, peers, and play. So for me, this is a lifetime you know, mission, and I hope you'll join me in this mission. I think it takes all of us you know, whether you're a parent or an educator or a policymaker or just someone who cares about kids, I think we all need to work together to make sure the kids continue to have those kindergarten-like opportunities for exploring and experimenting and expressing themselves. I think there's nothing, nothing more important than helping today's young people grow up as creative thinkers so they can be, you know, they'll grow up to become full and active contributors in tomorrow's society. Thanks very much.